Hello again, and welcome to another hometown daily news show. My name is Mayor Watt, and today is January. Doggone it, I messed it up. February 5th, 2023. I did it right the first time. Today's episode is titled Would You Rather Have an Alligator Sized Catfish or a Catfish Sized Alligator? We're going to talk about a Twitter wanting to charge $1,000 a month for brand verification. The open AI exec says, Hey, uh, don't ban chat GPT in schools. Sam Bankman freed psychiatrist hung out at FTX to coach and counsel. A cyber diplomat says their Twitter account was hacked. London has a $25 billion railway. Took 23 years to build. Activision Blizzard is going to pay $35 million to the SEC. Apple is going to introduce possibly a pricier iPhone Ultra in 2024. Kickstarter has uh, a game called Necromancer Revenant. The full name we'll talk about once we get to it. Elon Musk says bots making good content will be exempt from Twitter's plan to charge for API access. Chinese balloons flew over the U.S. three times during another administration. There's an app that allows fans to invest in their favorite musicians. Not quite sure how that actually works. And scientists are modifying catfish with alligator DNA to create hybrids for human consumption. But somehow I think it's going to be the other way around. Let's get into today's show. Hello, I am Marwat. That is hometown.com. And the AI from on high, the booming voice that controls everything in hometown. Good evening, hometown citizens. Yeah, so you want to say hello one more time for me? Good evening, hometown citizens. Yeah, a thanks, second hometown. time. Yeah, a second time. Sorry, uh, they're, uh, just making sure that there wasn't a, a glitch. So I had already introduced the show, and then I found out that... Um, I, I might have inadvertently mashed the wrong button here in Omtown, uh, causing me to not be heard, which might be a win for people who are stopping by and saying hello. Uh, maybe they just wanted to listen to the music that was streaming. <laughs> anyway, we're going to get right into today's articles. We've already got 12 articles because two came by late, uh, and well, <laughs> we couldn't let that go. <laughs> Oh, you're going to love it. Stay to the end. Um, and if you have any questions or comments and you're in chat, please feel free to throw them into uh, the chat and I'll respond, um, you know, right when you pretty much right. I'll stop everything and I'll say hi. So the very first article, it's in the New York Post. Twitter seeks to charge businesses $1,000 a month for brand verification. And uh, I did some quick calculations, uh, AI from on high. Um, there isn't a chance in hell that this is even going to pay even the interest on the debt that is bearing down on the stakeholders that have purchased and privatized Twitter. This thing could have been in perpetuity, just kind of cruising along, paying its debts. But then somebody came along, scooped it up and well, there's just no way in hell that this is going to get made anyway jesse o'neill over at market watch um the uh it's not gonna let me scroll i have to log in and i never log remember to log in before the show but anyway jesse o'neill is the author of this article um and it's from it's in marketwatch.com but it's a new york post article and the idea of charging a thousand dollars a month for brand verification um it's supposed to instill trust in the enterprise not, not, not the advertise. They're literally an advertiser and they're going to charge a thousand dollars a month to try and get a business to verify, to, to have a verified brand. So when people swing by Twitter, they're going to look at something and go, well, it's not, it's not the trusted account. So these brands are going to have to market that this is the trusted account and you can trust it. Everything else, I mean, it's the same heavy lifting that every business, every brand has to deal with anyway. 
that little check mark was supposed to be like the low hanging fruit to get somebody on board, a brand on board with your enterprise. And now you're going to charge them a thousand dollars a month for nothing other than making people engage on your platform. It's ludicrous. Some people may actually, some brands may actually do it just for, you know, the check mark and it's a different type of check mark. Um, I, I would not be surprised if that actually happens, but for crying out loud, it, it just seems ludicrous. Uh, and it's such a small amount of money in the grand scheme of things in relation to the amount of debt that's being borne by this company. Um, I, I certainly believe that it's a means to an end, hobble the business until it's really inexpensive and then bankrupt, but you still own the assets because nobody's going to buy the leftovers. They might even be able to buy it themselves with a proxy company there. Elon Musk got away from being held accountable for manipulating a stock, which I guess you can't even say that he manipulated it. He just dropped that. Hey, I can privatize this business. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on to the next article. But before I do, I'm going to throw the uh, URL into the chat and remind everybody that right down below me, hometown.showbot.tv, that is a URL that you can go to and you can vote on the articles that you find interesting and that you want us to pay a little bit more attention to that particular genre or, or uh, topic. Um, but we'll go on to the next article real quick and unless you want to throw something in there. AI from... I mean, I I just feel like every move from Twitter is to make it less palatable to advertisers, <laughs> to consumers. And so it does kind of beg the question, what is the end game? Um, I really don't understand the recurring $1,000 fee. I mean, if they're going to charge a corporation maybe a one-time fee or once every, you know, several years or something to verify, okay, maybe. But a thousand dollars a month, they're not going to keep verifying it. Um, yeah, you'd think that what it amounts to is, are you who you say you are? Yes, you are. Here's your check mark. Thanks for patronizing our business. Um, I We hope that you bring all of your customers to our platform as well. And now that we feel that you're a trusted account, you know, good luck to you, you know, make sure you follow all of the rules. <clears throat> so, uh, this next article is over in uh, the hatch ideas channel. Uh, schools are banning chat GPT, but an open AI exec says the com the uh, technology is a vital tool to improve learning in classrooms. Um, it has its area. It has, there is a time and a place for everything. And really, I think it's more about instance, um, so we could provide a demonstration of that in the classroom, right? Um, businesses can provide demonstrations to employees, uh, but it actually being utilized for students to do research papers and other things like that. Really, I think it defies the intent of higher education or any education, really, you really should be doing the due diligence. If you get stuck, then sure, go ahead, use chat GPT. Maybe it can stir your juices so that you are cre thinking creatively and you're thinking uh, a little bit more about the material because you don't know what you don't know. And you don't, nowadays, you definitely don't know where to look to get all of that information. Um, cause I don't think a lot of people spend time in libraries anymore. Uh, you know, it's all online and usually in a physical library, there's somebody there that you can just turn to immediately and say, what do I look for or something like that. But with chat GPT, you can literally ask a question. It'll pop up a bunch of stuff. What I have never done is ask it if it has references for a particular topic. So that might be an interesting experiment. I don't think that I'll be doing it today. Um, but I definitely will be um, looking into that. So OpenAI CTO shared her thoughts on ChatGPT's place in education in an interview with Time Magazine, uh, Marathi. 
said that she believes generative text can offer a personalized education to its users, and several school systems and universities have banned ChatGPT for fear of academic dishonesty. Um, it, that's certainly true. Uh, I, I would say that schools are a little leery of ChatGPT because of the fact that it's low effort. <laughs> um, you may be able to craft an inquiry wherein the result is something that is usable, but if you allow the student to just take it at face value and they turn it in, you're going to end up with a whole lot of problems. The quality of the work and the fact that it isn't theirs. Well, it right. The plagiarism becomes... factor, right? Correct. Um, and the blowback for an institution that accepts it is going to be pretty high, at least in a research institution. Um, Jordan Hart over at businessinsider.com put this article together. And um, let's see if there's something more in this article that might be um, of interest. There always is, uh, but let's see if we can suss it out real quick. So far, public school systems in New York, um, Los Angeles, Seattle, and more have banned the use of the bot due to concerns over plagiarism and cheating. Um, my problem with it being coined as cheating is we have the world's knowledge at our fingertips. Unless you are doing something like an industry certification or brain surgery prep, I don't think that banning resources should be really the, the thing of import. What really should be done is motivate students so that they learn what they need to learn and be able to discern what they could do a quick search for instead of going and finding an answer bank, which basically chat GPT acts like I would rather them having to explain why, Hey, I use chat GPT to get the answer. And this is why I used it. And this is what it told me. And I agree with it. And this is why I agree with it, but you're going to have to turn everything into a long form answer and not yes or no's because yes or no's, um, you know, true or fault or multiple choice. The whole goal of that is to answer that question correctly. And it's entirely punitive when you don't get it right because you don't necessarily get to do it again and again. Yeah, I think the problem is the people that use it don't necessarily use it as a starting point or to trigger questions. I mean, maybe adults do when they're just curious about chat GPT, but for students, they're probably trying to use it to write a paper or get the answers or and so in that sense, I don't think it has a place. Um, Leah Hendrickson is a lecturer that says we're getting students to critically think about these tools. She continued, as long as we're focusing on education as outputs, the, the GPTs and AI will be a threat, uh, but it can't replace the process of problem solving, which is the real way to learn. And I agree. Um, it, it's pretty typical both in enterprise and in academia that <laughs> sorry um there's something being very distracting at the moment um that uh when you are tested when you are um kind of put to task to evaluate performance or to see if you have right fitment within the enterprise or if you are the right person for the job you're given a task nowadays to see if you have what it takes to solve the problem and if chat GPT answers that problem and they don't mind you being forthcoming with the idea, well, I use chat GPT because the world's knowledge is at my fingertips. I'm a good fit, but there are people out there. There are businesses that will sit there and issue this technology. However brilliant it is, however progressive it is, they'll issue it out and say, sorry, you have to be old school. Go back to the library and look through the card file and pull up the Dewey decimal number Oh, really? The library has gone completely digital and you just search by ISBN or our title? Oh, okay, okay. Or a topic or a whole host of other things other than Dewey Decimal? Well, I guess I I, I guess I got my... I mean, don't you think we're going to hit a point where the librarian doesn't even know what that is? <laughs> <laughs> Eventually. Yeah, I think, I think that's definitely true. Hey, let's move on to the next article. Um, the next article, and I think this is one of the weirder ones, uh, but maybe it's missing context for me. 
Um, Sam Bankman Freed, psychiatrist. By the way, they're the person that ran FTX into the ground um, based on, well, let's just say quasi administration, maybe personal enrichment, um, maybe some other shenanigans going on. Anyway, uh, Sam Bankman Freed, psychiatrist, was hired at FTX to coach and counsel employees, according to a report. The uh, personal psychiatrist was on staff at FTX, according to Wall Street Journal. George, Dr. George Lerner uh, was hired to engage with employees as a coach, not a medical professional, the journal reported, because you know you can separate yourself from those duties by simply referring to yourself as a coach. One former employee. Especially when you call yourself a doctor to the employees. Yeah. Uh, you should have been coach. Right? You you get rid of the degree. Anyway. So one former employee blasted the doctor in a Twitter thread last December. Uh, let's just go over to the article. Uh, this is over at businessinsider.com. Aiden Pollard is the author and... Here is Sam Bankman Freed saying, wait, that's not all my money? Oh, let me put my shoes on. I'll be leaving. So yeah, Dr. George Lerner was hired to engage with employees as a coach, not a medical professional, according to the journal. Fascinating. This is, I guess, when it was heading towards its downward spiral, right? Yeah, it looks like it. And, you know, I mean, it the appearance of it is just pretty bad because it makes you wonder what the um, psychologist was, um, I guess, tasked with, with respect to the employees. Like you can think of like privacy concerns or manipulation, just all kinds of things come to mind. Fascinating, right? What if he was asking questions like, well, what do you think of Sam Bankman Freed? What do you think of exactly. the business? Do you think that telemetry well, stayed in the vacuum of that doctor? Possibly, right? No. no? <laughs> I don't think so because I don't I think the fact that the psychologist came on in another capacity. Right. They he would be asking and he was the personal psychiatrist for the CEO for crying out loud. They were amazing people, driven, brilliant, wanting to make a positive impact on the world. Uh, on the world, Lerner told the journal, "Conflict resolution was the toughest, uh, as most of my work has historically been with individuals. So suddenly he becomes an institutional psycho psychologist, or psychiatrist. Pardon me, psychiatrist. I was very concerned that people's happiness would be reduced by the lack of dating opportunities outside of a big city, or that they would feel compelled." to leave the company due to this, he told the journal for crying out loud. This, it sounds like the recruit. Yes, it does. And did you see that he was offering employees drugs and employees were concerned that information was going to perhaps make it back to bank and freed? <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm sure that it was all very, very compartmentalized. But we wouldn't know, right? We don't know. Not, not unless there is a disclosure later on of like a complete uh, transparency report. This is what went down at FTX. Following the collapse of FTX and amid charges of fraud against Bankman Fried, Lerner told the journal he's now focusing on rebuilding his private practice. No shit. Oh, wait, am I eight minutes in? Yeah, 20 minutes in. Um, <laughs> while Lerner's communication with Bankman Freed uh, have been subpoenaed, he has not been accused of wrongdoing per the journal. Not yet. Oh, I'm sure he's investigated by the medical board. <laughs> okay, I have to write this. I have to read this quote. Quote, in true FTX tradition, the shrink's experience consists of uh, befriending the Bankman Freed household a decade prior to the ability to be a bridge between affluent kids and their insatiable amphetamine dependency. <laughs> wow. Wow. A former FTX employee, Danny Cloud, detailed several encounters with Lerner and accused him of being a means for employees at the company to obtain drugs. Holy cow. Yeah, this guy's not going to be rebuilding anything. Well, he may be, but just in time for him to get sent to jail. Fascinating, right? I guess we'll find out. It, 
It really is. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be more in the news on that. I don't know. I think I enjoy uh, not having work in any kind of a business that would have a, an in-house psychiatrist. Um, so the next article is over in the mobile channel. Top U.S. cyber diplomat says Twitter account hacked, which um, just want to let you all know as a professional tip. If you are a cyber diplomat, you never want to have to make this statement. <laughs> so my account has been hacked. Perils of the job. A person named Fick, um, who we'll get to their name here, their full name in a minute. I, I don't know who Fick is, but they're on Twitter. Um, I wonder if they're paying a thousand dollars a month and eight dollars for personal accounts. The diplomat did not share further details about the hacking incident, and it remains unclear who was behind the breach or what its security implications might be. The Hill has reached out to the State Department for contact or comment, and they probably won't get much. Um, Julia Mueller or Mueller um, is the uh, author of this over at the Hill. And here is uh, Ambassador at Large for the U.S. State Department, Nathaniel Fick. Uh, speaks to students during a recruitment event at Stanford University in Stanford, California. Uh, this is back in 2022. So, I again, this should not be perils of the job. Um, the The problem here lies somewhere in a sequence of events. Either somebody was socially manipulated and the password was revealed, or there's a technical breach, which means somebody's weak ass password was exposed. Under no circumstances should somebody have been given access to the country's top cyber diplomat. Say it again. Nobody should have been given access to the country's top cyber diplomat. It should have been two-factor authentication. It should have been so rigid that he had to have a CAC card installed just to get access to it for crying out loud. Even if it is a third-party vendor, Twitter should never have granted access to anybody but him. Hello, Z. Well, yes, but also hasn't Twitter been getting rid of the very people that concern things like safety and security? And beyond, yeah. And bringing in apparently people from SpaceX to do some of the coding. And there's no more institutional awareness. So everything is a learning curve for everybody looking at millions of lines of code, I'm sure. But I just think that this is, I, I want to know how it happened because wherein lies the blame? Because Nobody, nobody in the industry says perils of the job when it is their account. You know, I understand a technical breach. Sure, that can happen. But then you say somebody screwed up. They didn't harden something. The password wasn't complex enough. Uh, somebody was fished, whatever. But there needs to be some accountability, some disclosure, some something. Um, and I'm curious where it was, you know, is somebody going to drop the bus on Twitter or somebody within it, or is it all going to be swept under the rug? So in addition to his personal account, Fick also tweets occasionally with the uh, CDP's official handle. So this, I mean, this has got to be targeted. I mean, how many people do we hear in the news that their Twitter accounts were hacked? I mean, I'm sure it's happened before, but it seems a little odd that this person in this position's account was hacked. Usually, usually it's either phishing or a, a technical breach, like uh, a weak password. Um, and what really bothers me most is that two-factor authentication isn't enabled. So why wasn't this person notified of a, a login attempt and then have to authenticate that login attempt? Um, I mean, I've had it on hometown and deactivated, deactivated it during testing and I'll be putting it back, um, once we make our modifications, but there, there's no reason to not have more advanced, uh, security in place, particularly for accounts like, you know, us cyber diplomats. 
So let's move on to the next article. Otherwise, you know, I can soapbox about tech forever. Um, this next article is London's $25 billion railway, which took 23 years to build, hits 100 million passenger journeys since opening in May. One station is big enough to fit the city's tallest, tallest skyscraper inside. And I, the, right when I heard that title, I immediately joked, yeah, but the tallest size skyscraper is only six stories tall. Um, I mean, it's London. So London's uh, latest railway line crossing $25 billion has clocked up more than 100 million journeys. The Elizabeth line took 13 years to build and stretches 60 miles. It says 13 years, uh, but in the title it says 23 years. So I'm really curious. Let's just go over to the article. Uh, Kate Duffy and Abby Wallace are the authors uh, for this article over at businessinsider.com. And again, the title says 23 years. I wonder if they've corrected it since, no, it says the Elizabeth line. Um, so maybe it's got more to it. Took 13 years and then 10 years later, I guess. I, I'm not sure. No, right? I don't know. We don't it's know. First, <laughs> it's the first, yeah. It, it said it opened on May 24th. So, all right. Since opening eight months ago, more than 100 million journeys have been taken on the Elizabeth Line uh, Transport for London. The TFL said on Wednesday about 600,000 journeys are made each day on the railway, making it one of the busiest lines in the UK. But I, I was really curious about the size of that station that they're talking about um, because the authors went through this um, train line to, and I'm curious what they were talking about here. So Paddington station is the, the Elizabeth line or on the Elizabeth line is so big that London's tallest skyscraper, the shard could fit inside it if laid flat. Yeah. So it, it's not tremendously tall. Cause I don't think that London has extremely tall buildings. And it looks like it is a 13 year project from something I'm I've looked up. Okay. So Wilde said the Elizabeth line was initially planned 23 years ago. There you go. And the construction took 13 years. So, okay. There's the context that we were all yearning to have. She learned how to add money to an oyster travel cart at London's Paddington station. Um, and there's <laughs> Queen Elizabeth riding the train. <laughs> You know, we chuckle thousands of miles away, uh, but she could uh, have us killed. So Z says uh, 1,016 feet for the shard. Really? That's that's bigger than I thought. Huh. Now I'm going to have to... Do a deeper dive into this because I'm really curious how they even accomplished this. Oh, if it was laid flat. So it's long, not tall. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it can't stand. It, it's not um, big enough to house it standing up. And they even said it in the article laying flat. So it's a thousand feet long. Um, I missed longer. that also. I was like, how are they doing this? You're the AI. <laughs> You're not supposed to miss anything. So now I got to figure out how wide it is. The, the shard, you know, how many... If you lay it down flat, is it only 10 stories high? Because that makes... That makes it 10 stories high inside this thing. So it cost $1.3 million per meter to build the tunnel between Elizabeth Line and Bakerloo Line at Paddington Station. Um, One million pounds per meter. My God, that is insane amounts of money. Um, so before the tour, there was a glitch in the radio system, which meant that trains had to stop running for two hours. Uh, Wild said there were still niggles and quirks that need ironing out with the railway. Why does I flash right over to Harry Potter? I, I probably shouldn't, but I do. And Z says that the picture of it makes, makes it look pretty big. Yeah, I agree. 
and clean. I love that description, niggles and quirks. <laughs> yeah, I like it too. Yeah, <laughs> Z said it was a dangerous word to try. <laughs> yeah, with the way that I'm missing which day it is, I'm pretty sure that it is a, a risky, a risky word. Let's move on to the next article. Activision Blizzard is going to pay $35 million fine to the SEC. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission investigation into Activision Blizzard has ended with a $35 million payment to the SEC to settle charges that Activision Blizzard violated government rules for the protection of whistleblowers and for failure to disclose information to investors. That is a drop in the bucket to the amount of money that they probably should have been fined. Again, I will never get Activision Blizzard as a sponsor, um, but they've got enough of my money anyway. Um, so the SEC's investigation started in 2021 with the state of California. A civil rights department filed a lawsuit against Activision Blizzard uh, over a uh, pervasive culture of sexual harassment. And this became all the rage of a discussion um, over the last, well, mostly for the six months after the initial um, debacle. Um, and um, I guess now in 2023, the fine of $35 million represents just over 0.5% of Activision Blizzard's 2022 gross profits of 6 percent Four eight six billion dollars, <laughs> or 011 percent of its gross. You see, um, abusive policy pretty much pays for itself. Um, but we're not condoning that at hometown. <laughs> oh, right. I'm glad you threw that in there. I'm not one of the, just so everybody knows that might be listening to this, I'm not one of the greed is good type of party line advocates, right? It's, that's not how it works. I believe in ethical capitalism, um, solve a problem and get paid for it. Anyway, let's move over to the actual article. Jonathan Bolding at PC Gamer wrote this article. Activision Blizzard's fine will cover breaking uh, whistleblower protection and investor disclosure laws. I wonder what happened to the whistleblower. Well, hopefully it was a, um, there's a type of litigation where the whistleblower gets a cut of the you know, piece of um, the action, right? Proceeds from the litigation. The so hopefully it was one of those. Is it 0.11% of the overall fine? I can look it up. I don't know. The EEOC investigation ended in a lawsuit which was settled for $18 million in 2021. That was the lawsuit's allegations prompted an investigation from both the SEC and the United States Equal Opportunity Employment Commission. And that one was settled for $18 million. So I wonder, let's see if they actually ended up with anything. Let me pause this. Whoa. I waited too long and an ad popped up. Um, let's see. It also looked into separation agreements employees signed when leaving the company, which had a clause mandating that the departing workers tell Activision Blizzard if they intended to disclose information to government agencies. That's fascinating. You're a cop, right? Because you have to tell me if you're a cop. Okay, so if this was the particular type of litigation called a key TAM. Um, that individual could have made up to 25% of the recovery, depending on the facts, um, if the government intervened. Yeah, I guess um, that might have offset the fact that they may not be able to ever work in the game industry again because they whistle for something that was actually beneficial, but some businesses actually ask you, have you ever sued your employer before? <laughs> That's really tough to explain. You know, yes, I have, but they were really bad people. You're not bad people, are you? Okay, we're just not going to hire you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the next article. Uh, the next article, uh, Z says, wow. 
Yeah, all you have to do is be completely abused and then blow the whistle and then survive the onslaught of whatever it is that a multi-billion dollar corporation is going to throw at you. Surviving that and then surviving the litigation without any employment, you'll be able to get 25% of the net proceeds from that case. Holy, it's like winning the lottery. 20 bucks. Slightly better on. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly. <laughs> Uh, the next article I is in the word. slightly, not a lot. <laughs> yeah, really. But there is a chance. Thank you. Um, oh, I think Z's taking notes. Yeah. So um, the next article is in the word in tech. Apple could introduce a pricier iPhone Ultra in 2024. I won't even go into this really because uh, it is a rumor. And while I appreciate rumors, it doesn't really have much that you can, well, these people say this and they've said other things and uh, yes, they are sometimes right and sometimes wrong. And Emma Roth over at The Verge wrote this article and, you know, no, you know, no doubt there probably is an iPhone Pro, Pro Max, Ultra, maybe there's going to be an Ultra Max and I don't know. There's all kinds of stuff that could come down the line. But if they think that it's going to be inexpensive, uh, guess again, this thing will probably ring in at around $2,000 um, because the top of the line um, phone from Apple is a Pro Max, I think is $1,200, something like that. It depends on like the size. It starts at like $1,200 and it goes up from there. Um, a couple of stages. I think the most expensive one is $1,500 or $1,600. Um, so you can imagine the next step is going to be with a much more powerful processor um, and um, flip it over. Uh, yeah, see, it says it goes over to USB-C, can even use haptic volume and power buttons instead of physical ones, which I think would be brilliant. You know, removing the, I, I don't even like buttons on my devices. I like a nice, clean touch screen. Um, so... Let's see. Um, Z says it did seem like we could only keep a phone for a year, like a decade ago, but now these phones will last you five or more years if taken care of relatively well. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I've actually, I used to renew on the regular because I was much more engaged in keeping up with the latest of tech. Um, and over time I've kind of gotten tired of doing that. Um, other people are doing it much more efficiently and, and, um, you know, they, they've got YouTube channels. Um, so I'm not really into that anymore, but you could easily keep an iPhone, you know, 14 for five years. Um, and not until the software starts pushing the limit of the CPU, um, do you really suffer from it? Because the the video quality is so high that we don't really need it as humans beyond that. We all be, obviously we could benefit from it because it's prettier, um, but faster and more storage and all of that kind of stuff doesn't necessarily need to appeal to everybody. So what you're going to end up with is kind of like a separation, a strata. You're going to get maybe 5% that are maybe, uh, maybe push it to two and a half percent are going to be pushing towards this high end ultra device, but the bulk of it, 80% is going to be right smack dab in the middle. And then there's strata on either side. You know, I'm going to get this version or that version, but this is just an appeal to people that have a whole bunch more money, um, which I appreciate, you know, the people who want the cream of the crop for tech are the reason why the, that little bit of, <sighs> that push into the ultra range means that the next generation is going to get the ultra range because the next step for them is going to be even better the ultra ultra <laughs> right yeah double ultra um so you know mark german and uh others um what is the other person's name i keep forgetting his name um he's another that focuses on Apple. Oh God. Anyway, um, 
they they always have rumors because they have been tied to Apple for 20 years. Um, I think his name is Quo, Ming-Chi Quo. Um, anyway, and they, they pop up every once in a while and say, this is what I heard. And they might get something from the supply chain. Hey, this is what I heard, or this is what I saw in uh, beta production. Um, and uh, then it gets leaked. And it's, it's always fascinating, but this is not what's going to make me pause in purchasing something uh, because I just want something good and reliable. And I've always seen um, the, the first iteration either has some fatal flaw in it um, or it gets uh, subsumed almost immediately, like the M1 immediately got taken over by the M2, like within a year, it just M2 was already on the horizon and uh, coming out for um, the same device that I have sitting right next to me. Um, charging it is an M1 and within a year it became the M2, the exact same model. So I'll wait until it's in the channel more. Okay, so, so let's move away. If you buy a device, you better be willing to keep it for a long time. Or sell it immediately. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. If you if you want to keep up with the Joneses, sell it every year or hold on to it for five years because then you can just drive that car right into the ground. Phone in this case. Um, okay, so the next article is uh, in the Tabletop Nights channel and that's all about tabletop gaming, but this isn't uh, a tabletop game. Uh, so Sword of the Necromancer Revenant is a game for PC, PlayStation, PlayStation 5 and 4, sorry, Xbox One and X and S and Nintendo Switch. So they're hitting every cylinder in this engine, um, which is awesome. And what's really neat about this thing is uh, apparently it's 3D and you can seamlessly switch from one character to the next while in combat. Um, and I'll take you over to it here in a minute, but it's um, Sword of the Necromancer Revenant introduces a new protagonist, Kara, um, voiced by Sean Chiplock, uh, with previous protagonists Tama and Coco also returning. The game sees players traveling across the world, including uh, assisting with the restoration of the sacred city of Yuda. I haven't played any of it. Um, but here is the article. Um, Alex Fuller is the author over at rpgamer.com. And this was a Kickstarter. And as you can tell, it was funded within two hours. I'm going to hit play real quick, but I'm going to jump and mute that faster than you can believe because I will get a takedown. Um, but it has this neat base building um, combat sys system where you can flip from one to another um, and uh, apparently a compelling storyline. So it says the game sees using the sword of the necromancer to resurrect defeated monsters as allies. They can also defeat revenants. Uh, once great heroes whose spirits wander the world to gain powerful summons. Uh, this combat system includes new elements such as air combos while monsters can have different tactics assigned the game features solo play with AI companion as well as split screen co-op. And it also includes the return of IR cards from the uh, previous game, which grants players bonus items, monsters, attributes, and the developer has expanded them into its own full fledged trading card game. So I think that this will be fun for those of you who are into this style of game. Um, let me just back up real quick so that you can see more of it. So, there you go. And apparently you can flip from one to another um, while you're playing it. Let's see if I can find that little bit. So, yeah, there's a whole bunch to it. Obviously, if you're listening to this via the podcast, you're not going to get any of this. You're going to have to go over to either Kickstarter and do a search for Sword of the Necromancer Revenant, um, or uh, it, I'm sure it's on YouTube as well. And I... No, the AI will probably not be playing this game. Um, okay, so we're coming up towards the end of the show. We've got four more articles. Um, so if you're new here and you have any questions or comments, throw them into chat. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to power through the rest of this. Uh, happy to discuss things. 
Uh, this next article is in the Hatch Ideas channel because it's about business. Elon Musk says bots making good content will be exempt from Twitter's plan to charge for API access. Basically, again, hobbling uh, engagement uh, to some degree, uh, i.e. the API now being sold um, at different levels, I'm sure. Uh, Twitter plans to charge developers to access the API uh, used to make third-party services and bots. Uh, they had already shut down some developers that were using the API for things that uh, en enabled people to be engaged on Twitter instead of having to go to Twitter. Uh, it, it was really absurd when I heard about it. Anyway, Elon Musk has tweeted that it would offer free write-only API for bots providing good content. He said he was responding to feedback when he tweeted late Saturday. Um, and uh, now who is the good content uh, judge here? <laughs> is it going to be Elon Musk? Uh, Z, can I say that? <laughs> Z just threw something in chat. <laughs> uh, let me know if I can say that. Um, so Stephanie Stacy over at businessinsider.com. I, I really want to say, okay, thank you. Um, so Z says, can we eat him yet? <laughs> uh, my hero. Um, so here's Elon Musk saying, <laughs> I'm not going to pay for all of this stuff. Are you kidding me? I'm going to drive this bus right into the ground and then buy the tires as they're rolling off down the road. No, it's just too funny, right? Anyway, um, so yeah, he's going to start charging it, but bots, right? And the AI says, who's the arbiter of good content? And of course it's going to be Elon Musk himself, right? You, you just know Twitter will enable a light, write Only API for bots providing good content that is free. So if you make any money on the platform, even by proxy, apparently you're going to have to pay hundred dollars a month so, for API access. I'm thinking if the content um, promotes how great of a person Elon Musk is, it'll definitely make it through. The, the thing about this is that he is so elitist that he believes that nothing more than a, a fiscal gatekeeper is going to be the means by which good content is born. The Scumbaggiest people on the planet could be billionaires. Granted, the scumbaggiest people on the planet could be completely broke schmoes. But guess what? A an ID verification doesn't guarantee that you're a good person. Paying $100 a month doesn't mean that you're going to be getting good content or creating good content or that you are an honorable person in any way, shape or form. Depending on who I say this to, I'll get shivved in the parking lot somewhere because they'll think that I'm attacking them. Z, that I believe is mostly true. I have yet to find a billionaire that A, is self-made and has done it honorably from beginning to end. Uh, a lot of them have attempted to buy back their soul, but usually it takes so much time that the people who know the true nature of the people have to die so that the, the reputation can be whitewashed later. Um, so it says Twitter announced on Thursday that it would block free access to its API from February 9th. Um, so just a few days from now. And uh, Musk said that the free access had previously been abused badly by bot scammers and opinion, opinion manipulators. Huh? I wonder if this is fake news kind of stuff, right? <laughs> Certainly. I mean, I've got two ideas for what that is, but I'm not going to say that here. <laughs> um, the developer behind the popular bot creation service, cheap bots done quick which currently supports around 54,000 developer uh, Twitter accounts, sorry, uh, previously announced that it is likely to shut down after February 9th. Uh, you, honestly, fine, fine. Uh, bulk bots doesn't really do much, right? The, the bummer about this is that some great content and great people could have been using this because 
that's what they could do, right? They have an idea and the bot could facilitate it, but they don't have the technical sophistication to produce the bot. But because there's a financial gatekeeper now in place, even great content. So now somebody's going to have to vet this content. Responding to Musk's latest comment, they wrote, or maybe not. God, who knows anymore? So what's really going to happen? Neither Twitter nor Musk immediately responded for requests to comment from Insider. So there's more in this article, um, but you can go over, you can follow the link through hometown and go and check it out. In fact, it would help if the mayor of hometown would throw the link into chat, but yeah, he's a slacker. Um, okay. So now we have, uh, three more articles. Uh, the next one is in the mobile channel. Chinese balloons flew over us three times during a former admin, uh, the previous administration. I don't even like saying the dude's name. It just kind of makes me a little queasy. Um, just looking at Cheetos does that. Um, as Republicans spent the last few days criticizing the Biden administration over its response to the suspected Chinese spy balloon that flew across the country, an official revealed during a briefing on Saturday that the U.S. was aware of three other instances that a balloon transited the country, transited the country, which is exactly what this balloon did. It started up in Alaska and just kind of cruise controlled its way all the way across the country. And from 60,000 feet, it probably had the ability with a high res camera to scoop up the breadth of the United States from beginning to end. Uh, it really depends on what the focal length of that camera or whatever radio. I mean, the thing looked like the International Space Station with a balloon. Uh, if you look at the, the YouTube uh, <laughs> thumbnails, that's basically <laughs> I made it a little bit more fun. But this thing, whatever it was, it, it had done it multiple times, not just this one, I'm sure others. Um, so what was really going on? And can you imagine if the United States started sending blimps, dirigibles, airships, as, they, as the Chinese government called it, and just floated it over there? It would be blown out of the sky faster than you can imagine. And to hell with anybody that complains in China that it landed on their grandma. No, we sat there and just said, oh, yeah, you know, let it scoop up as much intelligence as it can. Even if it is just trying to figure out what the weather condition is in the United States. You know what? Ask, ask a meteorologist here in the United States. Yeah. And then, yeah, as Z says, I think it's hilarious that China is, uh, how dare you accuse us of doing this on purpose? Well, <laughs> if it quacks like a duck. So why is this guy yelling at me? Uh, I feel like I'm in trouble. Sorry. There was a video for those of you who are not watching. Um, there's a video of somebody that's yelling at me and it has nothing to do with a Chinese balloon that flew over the United States three times during the last administration. I mean, this he person, might have been irate about the balloon. Maybe. Oh, I guess. I could, no, I won't go back. Um, so Stephen Newcomb, which has an awesome name, by the way, um, is uh, the writer for The Hill that put this article together. Um, and I had heard about this, as did the AI um prior to us even finding anything in hometown. Um, but luckily this filtered through hometown and, um, Biden administration authorized a missile strike that shot down the balloon on Saturday and Republican lawmakers had been arguing about the response should have come sooner. Oh, just like the budget, right? Oh, it's always immediately the most important thing, except that the previous administration raised the ceiling three times and spent money like it wasn't their own because it isn't their own. And you don't get rich by spending your own money. You spend everybody else's money. Um, and then you're not moving fast enough to start an international incident by blowing something out of the sky. Um, oh, and by the way, even if it did land on somebody in Wyoming, Apparently they didn't, Republicans didn't care. They just wanted it blown out of the sky sooner to, you know, show your dominance. 
you know, previous administration apparently let three of them float on by. And didn't notify the public as far as we know. Yeah, the public probably told the previous president and the previous president was like, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. You know, they're giving me money on the sly. It's not a big deal. I can't confirm that, but obviously he was buddy, buddy with certain people. So namely dictators, but and totalitarianists. And I've said too much. Like we're not going to get him as a sponsor, so I don't really care. Let's move on to the next article. I might get demonetized. Oh, look, I'm not monetized. Um, okay, so the next article is in the Word and Tech. This is an app that allows fans to invest in their favorite musicians. Uh, we uh, stumbled across this. Yes, Z says scumbags of all sorts. Um, and see, now I'm... Let me start this segment over. Um, this article is in the Word and Tech. Uh, the app allowing fans to invest in their favorite musicians. I love the idea of this. I don't know how it works um, because you can't own a person, <clears throat> just so you know. Um, and uh, there we go. So this is over at BBC.com. And will small maybe is their last name there's no little pronunciation key in here so i don't know if there's a small a i don't know um anyway on youtube the video is one of the uh his songs faded has been played 3.5 billion times and he has 42.9 million subscribers on his platform alan walker have you heard of alan walker has anybody heard of Alan Walker? Well, apparently 42.9 million subscribers do know who Alan Walker is, an electronic music artist. I it's guess I need a better electronic music database. Oh, man, I'm a slacker. I'm sorry. I, I'll hook you up. Um, it is a similar picture on Spotify where Anglo-Norwegian music producer and DJ has numerous songs uh, that have been listened to hundreds of millions of times while bands and other musical artists have long argued that the streaming services do not pay them enough walker who also earns money from live performances has amassed a net worth estimated to be as high as 20 million dollars that seems like too little for so many but obviously i lack the context of a professional musician so for the music industry, uh, the fans are normally just the consumers they pay to listen to the songs and album, um, attend the concerts, buy the merch. Last year, Walker decided that he would start to allow his fan base to share in his financial success. I don't think <laughs> that this will float. Uh, I, I don't, I don't see how this, I, I honestly, I don't see how this is actually going to be. A viable solution. He's done this by giving around 8,000 fans the opportunity to invest in four of his singles, sharing with them his streaming revenues. To facilitate this, Walker has used a new Sw Swedish we a new Swedish website and app called Corite, which handles all of the financial details, including the collection and exchanges of funds. But there's so much minutia in the rights distribution profiting. So I don't, I don't quite get how, um, <laughs> sorry, the AI just texted me. Will Wheaton. I have a hard time apparently saying this combination of words. Um, and I'm being made fun of on the back channel by the AI. And I'm letting you all know this. So Z says uh, those people are more invested in helping make him successful now, advertising by word of mouth. See, the issue, though, is that if they are making uh, money off of what he does, then they have a uh, part stock in him. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, that has never been allowed, at least in the U.S. market. Um, so 
I'll have to, this is really fascinating and it's, um, I might have a little bit more than a passing interest in this because, uh, I have a project that I've been wanting to make a reality called mix war where artists take other people's music, mix it up and fight for, uh, leadership leaderboard uh, status, right? Then you get prizes and whatever else. But if this is possible, then it changes the dynamic quite a bit because you can have an interest, much more engagement. By the way, there is somebody on Twitch that does exactly what Mix War does. Just wanted to let you all know out there. Um, And it's not me, Um, but he comes from the industry. So he has a lot of connections. What's up? It, I just wonder it's going to get snarled up because of copyright. Like it looks like a work for hire possibly. And then it gets into royalties. I mean, if they don't have a record label that might simplify it. I like the idea. I'm just trying to think how it'll work um, with the current copyright laws. Uh, because to me, what it looks like is, uh, so it, it goes into a little bit more detail here at the bottom of the article, right? So under Corite's model, artists secure financial backing from their hopefully growing fan base. In return, fans can hope to earn more money than the sum that they've invested, although it's important to stress that they can lose money. So it's kind of a Kickstarter for musicians, it sounds like. Problem here. All kinds of stuff, all kinds of work can be done by the artist without any of these stakeholders knowing that there is remuneration that there is some, there's a very limited fiscal awareness between these investors. And that's what they are if they're being categorized as investors. So they need to have full disclosure because they're buying into this artist and their songs. So I'm really curious how this is act here. Here's what I imagine. Everything is going great because people are making money or not losing a lot of money. But the moment that a whale comes in and buys a whole shit ton of music of this artist, not this artist, but of an artist, and they lose millions, this place is going down, like down like a a Chinese surveillance balloon down. So it says typically the rates of return are between 1.4 and 1.7 times the amount of the person investing. Why? Because it's the upward trend. And nobody is talking about the risk, but there's significant financial risk involved. And you can sit there and say, well, this and well, that they're aware, they know what they're doing, blah, blah, blah. But that's not what happens. Angel investors and, and uh, investors in general, they have to be cleared by various institutions to invest as angels or as in, uh, one strata of investment or another. It is not typical that some Joe off the street just invests as an angel investor in a business because the risk is so high. So they get vetted. Well, there's also limits on what amounts you can invest in certain types of investments. And it's which I'm never sure in this the people. type is not even one of the, the known quantities, right? Cause it's kind of a new idea. Yeah. And they get a 30 second snippet to listen to the song on the Corite site. So this is really interesting. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, feel free, follow the link, go through uh, hometown over to the BBC site and read more about it. Um, I'll be doing a deeper dive because I'm very interested in this. I think that it should be an option, but there's so much minutia here that I think it's dangerous. Um, for just anybody to invest Uh, while you might think that the risk is low, just look at FTX. People were doing really great because it was going up, but then somebody shit the bed and it all crashes and takes entire livelihoods away. Their entire, uh, like how people have put houses into FTX and now gone. Um, it's just insane. The amount of risk And while it's going up, nobody will complain. And we haven't even talked about what happens when somebody comes after the musician, which does happen if you're big enough, right? They say, oh, you ripped off my song or 
yep. this or that, well, these people may end up getting um, pulled into that as well. So again, I really like the idea, but I think there's a lot of things that need to be worked out. Can you imagine um, just a regular Joe invests, right? But might have personal assets on the side. A whale comes in and invests a whole bunch of money, but has a ton of lawyers that has the ability to defend. A copyright comes rolling down saying, hey, you stole my song and all of the stakeholders get subpoenaed because it isn't just Corite will get drawn into it. The artist will get drawn into it and every investor that made it possible for the violation to take place will get drawn into it. I, yeah, I find I mean, it a prosecutor one to make a good case would, you know, make a conspiracy case or something because there's multiple people involved. I mean, I might be getting a little far in a field, but sure. this could get to be a much bigger issue. But the artist knew that they were going to be in violation of the copyright. So there you go. Right. There's your conspiracy. I think it's fascinating as an academic discussion. But when it becomes real and real people are harmed and this is international, right? So where is the venue? Because I, we've had this discussion between the mayor and the AI. There is no international law. It's basically a cacophony of agreements. Um, and you try and practice us law in some other country and you'll get laughed at and then deported. Um, but they'll hold you for 48 hours and laugh directly at you for those full 48 hours and then send you back home. Um, <laughs> anyway, th this will be really interesting to watch um, because I never really paid attention to this because I never thought that it would be possible um, only because of my experience here in the United States. Um, paid for years to have the license to do this and all the while ultimately getting told, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. So, okay, let's move on to the next article. And the one that's going to make you uh, kind of creeped out a little bit, just a little bit. Uh, this is in the Hatch Ideas channel because it has to do with business, but scientists are modifying catfish with alligator DNA to create hybrids for human consumption. I think the title's wrong. I think it should be scientists are modifying catfish with human DNA to create hybrids that'll consume humans. Anyway, that's what led to you the mean title. With alligator DNA, because I think otherwise we're having some cannibals there. <laughs> no, it's going to be catfish with alligator DNA, and they're going to eat humans. That that that's why I said the title. Would you rather have a catfish-sized alligator or an alligator-sized catfish? Catfishing is getting a whole lot uglier. I said human DNA. That's why I thought you were talking about cannibalism. <laughs> yeah, so here, let me correct that. Scientists are modifying catfish with alligator DNA to create hybrids for human consumption. So scientists at Auburn University injected alligator DNA into farm-raised catfish. Z. You said, uh, what? And then noodling is about to get real strange here in Oklahoma. That's exactly where I went. Z, Z, Z is my spirit animal and it has nothing to do with alligator DNA. Um, yeah, that's exactly because noodling you basically, have you ever, uh, has the AI ever heard of that? Okay. Isn't that where you get fish with your hands? Yes. You stick your hand in their mouth. And they go nom, nom, nom. Now this is going to go nom, nom, nom all the way up to your shoulder and keep it. So I'll finish the rest of this. Uh, scientists found that the fish were more resistant to disease and less likely to reproduce. <laughs> less likely. <laughs> Have they never seen any of the uh, dinosaur movies, right? Jurassic Park. Now we've got Jurassic Pond. I mean, are the catfish swimming up to each other and going, hey, are you part alligator? <laughs> and is that a good or bad thing? I don't know. <laughs> hey, this this catfish really hurts when it bites my arm. It's not like the other ones. And you lift your arms out and it's just two little stubs. Yeah, Z says, yeah, you put your hand in a, in a log underwater. 
they bite your whole arm and you pull it out. No. Sorry, that silence was me going, yeah, no. No. I'm a diver. I'm a scuba diver. I have no problem with you know, sharks and uh, moray eels and uh, stingrays and poisonous jellyfish. All of that stuff. No problem. But I am not sticking my hand into the dark of anything, hoping that it slides into a mouth of anything. Anything. Anyway, they hope that the new and less disease prone catfish will one day be sold for human consumption. I'm just going to go over to the article and there's your picture. Hannah Gettahan, I guess, is their name uh, over at businessinsider.com. This is the reverse, though. I think that it's going to be an alligator sized catfish and it's going to eat humans. OK, let's see what else they say in this. I mean, how many uh, decades till we're reading an article that says, and it all started when they introduced the, you know, alligator modified catfish into the ecosystem. Yeah. Z says hard pass. Not going to ruin your fish fries. Oh, uh, yeah. So, uh, of course, CRISPR is being used. Catholicidin is found in the intestines as an antimicrobial peptide responsible for helping organisms fight diseases. Uh, I don't know. Heightened disease resistance among the catfish in comparison to wild catfish. And researchers noted that the survival rates of the catfish were two and five fold higher in an interview with MIT Technology Review. Wait, so wait, wait. I'm sorry, my brain isn't reconciling this. Survival rates for the catfish, which means that are these out there? What? So these genetically modified catfish are out doing what? Where? Anyway. Um, no, I think those are in labs or something and they're comparing it to wild catfish. But the survivability. Oh, they must be talking about like some type of harm befalling them. They survive up to five times more. I just I, I don't understand exactly what this experiment has. So anyway, however, researchers hope that the alligator and catfish uh, gene editing can be used in tandem with other catfish breeding techniques to help farmers with their catfish yields. I suppose these are fish farmers and not. You know, <laughs> they're, they're evolving these catfish with alligator. The alligator can just walk up to the farm now and, and help with the crops or something. I, I don't know. Now I want to change the title of the show from <laughs> Have You Heard of Jurassic Pond? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's going to get eaten one of these days. Come on. Didn't we learn our lessons from Wuhan? Anyway, although consumers may be uncomfortable with the idea of catfish sharing DNA with an alligator, Rex Dunham and uh, Baofeng Su, uh, two of the lead researchers of the study, told MTR that the hybrid meat would be perfectly safe. Of course, of course it's going to be safe right up until it's not. Bad bat COVID-19. Oh, let's not repeat that again. <laughs> Dunham said I, that they would eat it in a heartbeat. No. I think this catfish alligator dinosaur is going to eat your heart there, Dunham. So big nope, big pass. You know what? I'd eat lab-grown meat. I have no problem with that because I know that it's just it's natural lab-grown meat. It's going to be processed the same way that you know, other would be, and it wouldn't cause the demise of some animal or whatever. Um, what I don't want is a catfish alligator hybrid. <laughs> I just, there's something that feels wrong about it. And, and maybe it's a level of in, ignorance and mistrust. Um, but this goes like a above and beyond because this thing is going to be out there and, Evolution doesn't just pause because, hey, a human started uh, meddling with genetics. It's going to keep on mutating, probably at a different rate than if it would have been a natural 
order of things, right? Uh, people, not people, but things evolve. But when we fool around with the genetics, doesn't that wobble happen a little bit faster? Hence the reason why we have a bad bat. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking, what if they accidentally scooped up the gene for chomping or whatever the, <laughs> for alligators and then <laughs> or whatever it will be like they're not. I mean, are they really that uh, squared away that they know exactly what they're modifying? <laughs> Catfish dentata. It's going to smile and it's going to have this huge grin of teeth, right? <laughs> Probably better gums than I have. Anyway. Okay, y'all are awesome. Thank you very much for hanging out and chat. Thanks for adding to it. I might actually end up changing the name of the the, the episode to Jurassic Pond. Um, I think that's just too, too cool. Okay, uh, so I am Merwat. That is hometown.com. Uh, we're doing construction on the background, so ignore that for now. Well, you can pay attention to it if you want, but be sure to go over to hometown.com. Be sure to like and follow and ring the bell and all of that over on YouTube and follow here on Twitch. Download the podcast. We are 36 episodes into the year already. I think it's all pretty awesome. All right. Anything else you want to say bye to everybody? Have a good night, hometown citizens, and hope to see you tomorrow. Take care, everybody. See you, Z. Bye.